Hello everyone. Welcome to our third Pasanga event at the University of Chicago. We are so happy to be able to offer this program to you today. We are now dancing our feet off inside this building, the I House, where we usually hold our events. We all know that these are difficult times, especially for our communities, and a celebration seems almost out of place. However, we couldn't let the Hispanic Latinx Heritage Month pass without creating an opportunity to be joyful and hopeful together, even if remotely. We hope that you take this time to relax, grab a drink or two, and enjoy the music and conversation we are offering you this evening, wherever you are. This program would not be possible without the Pachanga guys, Memo, Daniel, and Marino, who have been the best and most responsive collaborators and creative minds during the past few weeks of planning. Thank you guys for all that you do in Chicago to support our cultures. We are grateful to the University of Chicago Provost Office and in particular Melissa Gillian for their support of this initiative through the Diversity and Inclusion Grant. Thank you also to our historical co-sponsor, the Ad House, and our new partner, the Harris School of Public Policy, right across the street from here. Lastly, I want to thank everyone who have been part of the Latinx Heritage Month Celebration Committee in the past couple of years, including Tomas Uriostegui, Gabriela Arismendi, Maya Rodriguez, and many others. And a special shout out to Maria del Toro, the founder of this annual celebration. Thank you all for your leadership and support of our Latinx community at New Chicago. Now, Maria has a very special message to share with you. So without further ado, bienvenidos a Pachanga. Saludos from Honolulu, Hawaii. My name is Maria del Toro and I am an alumni class of 2019 of the University of Chicago. I am primarily here to be a hype woman for Pachanga, which is the real reason we are all on Zoom today uh, to salsa in our pajamas like nobody is watching. So I am going to be short. I want to share that I remember this time in 2017, in my very, very first day at the University of Chicago. It was actually the day right after Hurricane Maria had hit Puerto Rico, and I felt very, very far away uh, from my family in New York and my family in Puerto Rico. And I was absolutely shaking in my boots on my way to class. I felt so small. I felt so out of my league at East Chicago. And I just distinctly remember calling my friend Chris. And it's right before my 8.30 a.m. class. I was crying and he was busy driving his four-year-old daughter to daycare while I was crying about being scared of my first day of school. And from the back seat, I just heard his daughter, Kaylin, scream, Titi, you got this. And a year later, after I had successfully written the Inclusive Climate Grant to establish the CU Chicago-wide Hispanic Heritage Month celebration, uh, I heard this very familiar sound of salsa playing from the I House Ballroom as we hosted Pachanga for the first time. And it was really the first time where I was absolutely certain, oh yeah, I do got this. And so, of course, I want to welcome back all of our returning students, our alumni, faculty, staff, community partners. We are so happy to have you back. And most of all, I want to give a special welcome to all of the new students at the University of Chicago and let you know you've got this. Uh, welcome to the family. It is our deepest hope that you will remember this as one of the moments in your U Chicago trajectory that gave you confidence uh, that there is a family here for you that is committed to your success, that has your back, uh, and we are holding space for you in hopes that you will hold space for the next class of uh, Latinx students coming in. So on that note, I introduce Pachanga and give you all permission to salsa in your pajamas, whether you are in Hyde Park or anywhere else in the world today. Thank you so much for joining us and I give you Pachanga.
Thank you so much for having me. My name is Jocelyn Marie. I'll be singing some originals for you this evening. Day dread and your paycheck cause it looks the same when will it change if you dream of something else then go ahead uplift yourself dive away it's hard to look inside your soul why would you even dare nothing else is in control Yet my demons tell Are you happy? Are you sad? Raise your hands up If you're tired of this plan Are you happy? Because I speak my mind If you have a problem Well, let's sit down with someone Yes, I am Latina Pero no habla español No soy idiota Porque si entiendo It's hard to look inside your soul Why would you even dare? Nothing else is in control But Demon stare Are you happy? Are you sad? Raise your hands up If you're tired of this plan Are you happy? Are you sad? So this next song is called Para Siempre. If you feel it, I need you to get up, do a little, little shoulder. Feel 
that you got it I wanna know how Everyone you know in the circle somehow Feel it, you got it, you're not insane Everyone you know has made a mistake We all got a story to tell But are you hurting all the others while you're making them feel Well, you want it, you got it And you know it's the same But I know para siempre, para siempre Quiero tu amor Para siempre, para siempre quiero tu amor. Para siempre, para siempre quiero tu amor. Para siempre, para siempre quiero tu amor. I promise you something, a promise that you can't forget. You better believe a memory will be thinking about for a few days, a few days. We all got a story to tell, but are you hurting all the others while you're making them feel? Well, you want it, you got it, and you know it's the same. But I know para siempre, para siempre quiero tu amor. 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 Oh, oh. Thank you, thank you. All right, searching.
the tunnel beyond the ground but don't get it twisted baby because i'm brown no i see my magic floating around and i smile because i know what i have found oh How can we be so true? Who's the victim and so easily diffused? Your love, I'm searching for your love. Two more for you. The next one's called Question. And all of these songs that I write are for anyone who has ever felt insecure at some point in their life. Remember, you are loved. I love you, Sam. Won't you please tell me the truth? Involved for other reasons too. I never intend to run away. Been making the moves and only murder ways. Oh, won't you please send some help? Won't you please, won't you find 
question who you are why can't we take this to another space we're shining on the tongue and now we both know this stuff isn't easy but you've got to hold on Won't you follow me, my love? I can take you very far I want to show you Muchas gracias. Aww. Awesome. All right. Well, this is going to be my last song. I dedicate this to my amazing parents. Tejano. We're from Harlington, Texas. Shout out to all my family in Texas. wrapped up in clover the night I looked at you and I found a tree that I can speak to a dream that I to 
a thrill that I have never known. Oh, yes, you smile, you smile, and oh, when the spell was cast, and he. University of Chicago, Pachanga, Uchumog. Thank you for joining us uh, today. Uh, coming out next, we have uh, a wonderful conversation with Barbara, Barbara Barreno, Paschal, uh, Milvia Rodriguez, and Daniel Martinez. Uh, wonderful conversation. Uh, so don't go anywhere. We also have Madera Once, and thank you to Jocelyn Marie for blessing us, opening the, opening the night. Uh, welcome to Pachanga, brought to you by the University of Chicago. Thank you. Welcome to the Latinx Heritage Month celebration. Today we are joined by uh, Milvia Rodriguez, program, program Administrator at the College and the Harris School of Public Policy, Daniel Martinez, co-founder of Pachanga, and our guest speaker, Barbara Barreno Pacho. Uh, Barbara is a lawyer who serves as commissioner with the Illinois Human Rights Commission. Uh, she is also a graduate of the University of Chicago Harris School of Public Policy. Uh, we have a few questions for you today, Barbara, and thank you for joining us. Uh, the very first question is, can you share a little bit about your background and how you got to where you are today? Thank you, Memo, and thank you to the planning committee for inviting me to this important celebration. I was born and raised in Southern California in LA County, and my father is an immigrant from Ecuador. He came to the US 50 years ago to study and eventually settled in California with my mom and my two siblings. I was born and my younger brother and sister were born. So there are five of us um, growing up in California. I really enjoyed living in California because I was able to learn a lot about myself and, and my heritage as an Ecuadorian American and a member of a large family. When I went away to school, I missed that a lot, but then I met a lot of wonderful friends in um, different parts of the Latin, Latinx community in particular, and got to be part of a larger community than the community I grew up in. So after those years in college, I went to law school and ended up being part of the National Latina Latino Law Student Association, I ended up being the chair of that organization in my third year, because I felt it was really important to show who I was and be part of the community of Latina, Latino, Latinx lawyers. So I was part of that organization in law school. And then I moved to Chicago nine years ago after law school to work at a law firm in downtown Chicago um, for a few years. After that, I moved on to the Harris School of Public Policy to get a master of public policy and then worked as a civil rights attorney at the Chicago Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights. I was very fortunate last year to be appointed by Governor J.B. Pritzker to the Illinois Human Rights Commission, where I currently am today, uh, one of the commissioners. Thank you again for having me. Thank you, Barbara. Uh, I'm so glad you're with us today. So I have a, the next question for you. Uh, so what role do you think uh, your identity as a Latina woman plays when approaching your priorities in your work? It's very important for me to express my identity as a Latina, as a mother. I have a three-year-old daughter, as a family member, a wife, um, sister, and friend, because I want people to know that I care about the communities in our country, and I want to be able to express myself in ways that are authentic to me. 
my dad came here, like I mentioned, 50 years ago. And over time, we've learned a lot about the experiences of not only people from his country, Ecuador, but other people who are uh, from different countries around the world and other experiences that they've had as immigrants in this country raising families. So for me, it's always important to share who I am and what I stand for and just the values that I hold dear and to, to know that other people can share those values with me as well. I really enjoy learning about different perspectives. Uh, when I went to college, I got to meet a lot of people from different backgrounds and in the entire diaspora of um, Latino and Latina communities. And it was wonderful to just get that perspective and also learn more about who I am and where my family comes from on, on my dad's side. So for me, it's very important to express that identity as a member of the legal profession and as a person who is interested in global affairs and local affairs as well. What are some things you do at home to connect to your heritage? And how do you keep tradition alive when uh, so far removed from your family in Ecuador? I really like to make sure that I'm in constant communication with, first of all, my dad and, and my family in California, because my parents and my siblings are in California while I'm here in Chicago with my husband and daughter. So mm -hmm. making sure my daughter knows her grandfather is really important, having time. And, and in this age of Zoom, since we can't go and visit them, using FaceTime and Zoom and other means of communication, as well as other ways to connect with family in Ecuador who I don't see very often at all. I haven't visited Ecuador in some time. And so it's important to maintain those lines of communication as well. So just having conversations with family members and also introducing my daughter to the Spanish language. Um, she actually really enjoys listening to some Spanish language shows on her tablet. Even though she's three years old, she's still trying to pick up some words and also teaching her some basic words so she can understand that culture because the Spanish language is a really important part of the Latinx culture and cultures of many countries of people around the world. So in, including that, also learning about different literature and other forms of media, music. She loves music and so do I, and just listening to different artists and Spanish artists and different genres of music, as well as different books, reading Spanish language books as well uh, as English language books. All those things are really great and helpful to build an awareness and understanding of la cultura and the history in order to promote that sense of family and togetherness, even when my actual family is thousands of miles away. What are, what are the biggest challenges you've had uh, to overcome when navigating educational opportunities at elite institutions? When I first left for college, uh, I went straight across the country and just navigating a world that was different in, in many respects from the world that I grew up in and realizing that I have to ask for help and it's okay to ask for help. I, my parents are very hardworking and they taught me to be self-reliant and to learn as much as I can on my own. But at the end of the day, I believe in a community where we can help one another and we can turn to one another. I wanna help people as much as I may need help from somebody else. So learning that lesson was really important at, at the first university I went to and then going to law school as well. Uh, in my family, I'm the first person to be a lawyer. I didn't know any lawyers in my town. I had met some lawyers, so I didn't really have an exposure. I didn't have exposure to any Latina, Latino, Latinx lawyers at all. So being able to navigate that world took a lot of creativity. And again, being able to ask for help and joining groups like the National Latina Latino Law Student Association was critical for me. And being part of a supportive community where I knew that other people who had been in law school as well with a similar background were doing it and I could succeed as well. So joining networks, um, being part of organizations that supported success of Latina, Latino, Latinx lawyers in, in the legal profession was really important to my success and to feeling good about my decision. It's okay to be in an environment where you're not one of many because you can set the path, you can blaze the trail for others to follow, as long as other people are following and doing the same thing. So what's important to me is always sharing my 
words of wisdom, if there are any, and advice with people coming up so that they know they could do this too. They can see someone who looks like them who's done it and they know that they can achieve it as well. So just asking for help, uh, being part of supportive networks and maintaining a positive attitude because it can be very easy, especially in times like these to feel discouraged or not have hope for the future in a way that you might've expected. But the good news is that we're all going through some of the hardships and it's okay to know that not every day is gonna be perfect, but if you keep thinking and hoping and planning out what you might wanna do and telling people about your goals and dreams, it's more likely to become a reality than questioning whether you can achieve them. So for me, it's always about expressing myself and some of my thoughts and feelings and also giving encouragement to people coming up that they can do it too. The, the next question, and, and Barbara, you and I have talked about this uh, in the past. Um, you have a background in law and you have a background in public policy. Um, what advice do you have for, for students who might want to combine different careers into, into kind of their professional uh, uh, work? Uh, what, what challenges have you had in, in kind of working in both fields? Uh, and uh, what advice in general do you have for, for students who are you know, um, uh, curious and intellectually uh, trying to, to, to pursue different, different paths? When I said earlier that it's okay to ask for help, it's also okay to ask questions and to ask people in different fields what got them to where they are, what led them to pursue that path, because you never know in the future what your path might lead to. For a lot of students, you have so many opportunities, it's hard to decide. You might have a lot of passions and a lot of issues you care about, and it's okay to not know exactly what path you want to pursue right now. What's more important is to explore and cultivate the interests that you have, and whether it's attending a lecture, taking a class, doing a project, volunteering for a local organization. There are so many organizations out there that need help, um, and, and students are welcome. Uh, to learn, be interns, and get that educational experience. So what I like to tell people is to just pursue things you're interested in a little at a time. You know, you don't have to go 100% all into one thing if you're not sure that's what you want to do. And then as you think about educational opportunities to look at your longer term goals and ask, well, what are some ways I can get there? For example, if you want to be a leader of a nonprofit or advocacy organization, what kind of skills can help you be an effective leader? Who are leaders that are in those roles and what have they done? You don't have to do exactly what they've done, but you can take that as an example and then tailor it to your own path. For me, being a lawyer was very important because I wanted to learn skills that I could use to help people navigate different systems and figure out ways to help them solve their problems. And lawyers are problem solvers and they represent clients to the best of their ability. And in going to policy school, I thought that I would wanna learn skills to be able to understand legislation and policy advocacy from a larger perspective and be a more informed citizen and be able to assist people in some of larger areas that maybe are not purely legal in nature. And having that exposure was important to me. But in, in life, we always you know, have opportunities that come up that may be different from what we expected. Uh, I was very fortunate to have the ability to go to policy school after having been a lawyer, but that's not the only path. Sometimes people will be a lawyer, practice law, and then do something else, and they don't have to go to another school. It's just finding the path that works. But fostering that curiosity and always asking questions, asking people about their path and then pursuing different ways to learn more about an issue through volunteer service, learning through a class or other ways can really help get you on the path that will ultimately lead to, to where you wanna go. Um, so through all your um, commitment, you know, work, volunteering, uh, family, how do you stay motivated and energized uh, between all the things you do. And on top of that, um, what advice would you have for other young mothers out there, young women um, in the workforce, um, not necessarily lawyers, but just uh, whatever they're doing? 
you might have heard the expression, you can't have it all. Um, it, it's really difficult to achieve everything that we want to achieve in life at the same time. What's most important is finding the priorities that are that are top of mind for you as an individual and as a family member and as a member of your community and then figure out how the different pieces come into play. For me, one of my top priorities, of course, is my daughter and my husband and my family and making sure that my daughter has the best opportunities to be the best version of herself she can be. Another priority I have is to make sure that I can share my information and skills and advice with people coming up. Like it's really important for people to see that someone like me was able to go to law school, graduate from law school, go to a different school. If they, if they want to go to a different school, they could do it uh, and achieve different success and in other areas. So one of the things that helps me is just keeping that list of priorities and also really finding some time to relax. It's really hard when there's so much going on in the world and there's so many ways to help. Like I mentioned earlier, volunteering with an organization, that's an excellent idea. And maybe it might be tough to do it for four or five different organizations. So finding one or two or finding a couple of areas to explore at one time, that's very helpful because then it doesn't seem like you're taking on too much. And sometimes for me, I do feel like I have a lot that I am focusing on at one time or that I'm thinking about because there are so many issues happening in our world. It's just, if you have your priorities set, whether it's your family and, and for most people that, that could be the case or, or perhaps in that moment, it's your career and making sure that you can achieve the best you can in your career. And you can also prioritize career and family both. It's just, it's difficult with the time and how much time you allocate to every aspect or, or advancing the interests of your community. So keeping the priorities straight and also knowing that life is a marathon, not a sprint, and that there are different times when you may be more involved in your career or with your family or with outside activities, or maybe do all of them and, and sleep a little less. But, but what's most important is just deciding what matters most and how much time you want to spend on each of those or all of those things in order to get, I guess, or to achieve what you're hoping. It's not easy. It's not easy. And I think about it a lot and how I always think I could do more, but there's only so many hours in the day. <laughs> there's only so many days in a week and weeks in a year and, and everything. So I, prioritization and knowing your values as well, knowing what values are most important to you and what will help you understand where you need to focus your time. I was going to say, um, for, from my point of view, for, for somebody like yourself to say, you feel like you could do more when, you know, we, we all know your background. It's like blows me away and it's very motivating to myself. Just, uh, just want to throw that out there. <laughs> well, thank you so much. And, and the work you do is very motivating to me as well, because educating our youth is per perhaps the most important thing we could do for, for our future of our planet and our society. So thank you for all the work that you're doing as well every day. Thank you, Barbara. Th this next question is, is all about expectations. Uh, and it says, children of immigrants often find themselves somewhat torn between the expectations of their parents and their own dreams. Um, did you have such a dilemma? And if so, how did you tackle this? When I went to college, I, I was so grateful to have the opportunity to study at Harvard. I was thinking about what would be the best way to be successful. And one of the career paths that I had contemplated was financial services, because I, uh, being one of five children, we often had to stretch the dollar and we had to take out loans to go to school. And I worked a, a second and even, I worked two jobs while I was studying part-time in college. And so I thought about a career in financial services and thought about how hard my dad worked to get to the US. and provide for all of us. And that was something I pursued and I was very interested in, but my heart was telling me I wanted to be a lawyer. So it was difficult because that was a way to gain financial success and achievement. And it's something I'm sure my father would have supported and did support when I was thinking about it. But ultimately he also supports education and, and continuing our education. So when I made the decision to go to law school instead, he was very supportive of that decision because he knew that it was something I had been thinking about and I wanted to do. 
And then a few years after I graduated from law school, I was uh, in, in a large organization, a large law firm, I decided to shift gears and go to the Harris School and do a Master of Public Policy. And again, one of those situations where continuing in my path at the law firm would have led to more uh, financial success and achievement. I just knew that I wanted to keep learning. I'm, I'm constantly learning. I, I love learning new concepts and, and from people and, and ideas. And so I thought, well, let's see, why do I want to do this? And then after explaining it to my family, uh, they understood, okay, this is, again, this is something she wants to do. And, and I'm a pretty hard worker. So they know that if I'm going to do that, I'm going to do my very best, like be my best self at it. So it was easier than I thought to navigate that. Uh, but I do understand and appreciate from other people I know that this can be quite a challenge, whether it's going away to school for college or grad school, or even going to grad school when you could be working and supporting family, going to school full-time versus part-time. These are all very tough decisions. And it, the, the commitments we make to our family are really important. And our role uh, in recognition of all that they did and the sacrifices they did for us, right, is, is an important one to think about. At the same time, we have to do what's right for us in our heart, and hopefully all of us can decide how to pursue that. Like I said earlier, prioritizing and, and committing to our values and then having that conversation with the family member or family members who may have a different view. But for me, I was fortunate that my family, my dad values education, and I was able to pursue those things and, and work very hard to make sure that I can provide for my family because that was very important to me. Thank you, Barbara. Um, I have one more question for you. Um, so we have heard about your hard work. We have heard about some of the opportunities that you have had. Uh, we haven't talked very much about good luck, right? Uh, but you know, everything that happens is kind of a combination of those three uh, things. Uh, what do you think has been for your for your, in your case, uh, in terms of you know opportunities that you have been given, uh, given uh, hard work, uh, good luck, um, and and what advice do you have for uh, for our audience here? And um, in terms of how do you approach um, closed doors? Uh, how do you approach frustrations or or things that might not go your way? Um, what are the tools that you have developed throughout all these years? And I'm sure you have had moments when things didn't work quite right. Um, what advice do you have for, for our audience here on how to approach those things? A lot of the achievements that I've had over time have just been, in my view, personal opinion, the result of hard work and timing, good timing and the ability to express myself and, and say what I wanted to do and, and make a goal and stick to that goal. When I was attending college, um, I mentioned my dad is from Ecuador. My Spanish was something that I really wanted to improve. It was important for me to have that be part of my identity, not only someone who understands the history of my heritage, but also the language. And so I went away to study abroad. No one in my family had done that except my dad. Uh, so he had come to the US, but no one knew how to navigate that process or how to go about that. But I really wanted to do that. I wanted to learn. And so I'm the kind of person that when I make a decision, that's what I'm doing. Uh, so I went to Spain. I was in Madrid. I visited uh, many cities in the country, learned a lot about Spanish history and how it relates to the US. And then I've taken trips to other countries through different leadership programs like Mexico and Guatemala. I really wanna visit more countries around uh, Latin America, Central America, all over the world. And for me, a lot of it just comes down to knowing, I keep mentioning this, but your priorities and your values. And if you know what your values are, you can pursue them with confidence because these are things that are important to you. Like I mentioned earlier, for me, it was, having a better understanding of the Spanish language. So I went up to study abroad. I've done these leadership programs. I've gotten to know people from different countries. I led the National Latina Latino Law Student Association. These are really important. And then another um, example of that is when I decided to go to policy school. I, I had researched the Harris School. I spoke to people in admissions. I spoke to students at the Harris School. I learned as much as I could about it because I wanted to be part of that community and, and be part of the University of Chicago. So I would say, once you know your priorities and your values, go all in and, and do what you can 
to promote that part of yourself and let other people know. Tell people of your intention, uh, whether it's to achieve a certain degree or to pursue a career opportunity, or maybe even to volunteer or be, be a board member or, or become part of an organization. Let people know what you wanna do. And, and as you grow your network and figure out how, um, how things work, because a lot of it is about relationship building and building those connections with people. If you let people know, then they can help you. And the same thing, you can help other people, but only if you know what they need. So um, making your stating your intentions and living through them through your values, as well as just timing. I mean, sometimes it may not be the perfect time to do something, but risk taking is a part of life and, and calculated risks, right? I, I'm a pretty risk givers person actually from being a lawyer, but I have taken some risks in my life to pursue new opportunities. And, and some would say going to school again after already having a career was a little bit of a risk, but I, I wanted to learn and I had those values. And then just maintaining a positive attitude. It's it's so difficult when there are a lot of obstacles, whether it's financial or familial or just self-confidence. I mean, I, like I mentioned before, I'm the first one to be a lawyer. I had never studied abroad other than my, my dad. I didn't have a lot of mentors in certain areas because there weren't that many Latinas in the law, at least where I was coming from. So just putting myself out there and pushing past any doubts and uncertainties. And every day there are doubts, but if we know what we believe in and what matters to us, then we can push past those doubts and the adversity. And also lending a hand to other people. I mean, you never know what your career will lead to if you decide to help someone else with something. Maybe it wasn't your area of expertise, but if it can help somebody, maybe it can help you as well. And so volunteering, that's been really key for me. And so if I'm thinking about advice, in addition to what I said earlier, is making sure to take time to help somebody, whether it's volunteering at a local organization or at the school that you attend or in a local religious um, institution, a church or a synagogue or anywhere, finding a place where you can help people who are in need is really important because it helps you remember what your values are and what's most important. And this is my personal opinion, but I found that doing this kind of volunteer work and helping people who truly need help can really help frame what I'm trying to do and ground me and keep me going, especially when times are really hard because there's always someone who I can lend a helping hand to. Our last question is, um, what in your opinion is the path to higher educational opportunities for low-income Latinx communities? What's really important in my personal view is having supportive community structures, whether it's uh, faith-based communities or other service um, programs, uh, operations, organizations that provide services to people in communities of need, low-income or otherwise. It's really critical to have the support system so that students can see that path to higher education because the classroom may be one thing, but there are other activities that students can do, whether it's sports or dance, performing arts or music or any number of things that if students have the opportunities to do those additional activities in addition to their classwork, they can be creative and pursue things that match their values and, and the priorities that they set. So having supportive communities and communities where people can talk with one another and share ideas is really important. Um, I'm part of a local organization here called the Hyde Park Kenwood Community Conference and I'm a board member. We have a schools committee and we set to give grants to, to schools that submit applications. And so that's one way we can serve the community. We also have a parks committee that works to beautify parks. And so the students who are in the communities are part of a larger structure. It's not just them, but they're part of a larger community. So if there are local community groups that provide after school um, programming and all kinds of other educational and extracurricular opportunities, it can really help make college a a, not a, just a possibility, but a probability. And also there's financial aid and other considerations, but I'm just thinking the ability for students to see college as a path, not just as something they might be able to do, but as something they want to do. And it's not for everyone, but for the people who do want to pursue that, seeing that there are opportunities for them to grow as people express creativity, 
do things that they may not be able to do at home and see that there is a future in many different ways, whether it's a two-year college, a four-year college, another type of institution where they can continue to grow and ultimately be able to find a career path that works for them and so they can succeed in that and, and be the people they want to be. Um, so I think communities that are in support of one another, having different services available and using those services and also talking with one another and having community dialogue on issues and whether it's online or right now, you know, online is the way to go or in person, which hopefully will happen in the future. Just be maintaining the communication and, and sharing opportunities with one another and building those is what really will help a lot of students, low-income students and Latinx communities to advance to the next stage of their education. Well, thank you so much, Barbara. Um, and thank you for joining us today and inspiring and sharing your experience, your words of empowerment I mean, I, I know it means a lot to us and, and our students and, of course, parents who are watching, uh, watching this because you are uh, a wonderful example and, and representation of, of the many things that people can do and, and, and learning about your path is, is, is a really, really unique opportunity. So thank you again for joining us today. Thank you for having me. It was a pleasure to speak with all of you. Thank you, Barbara. Yeah, thank you so much.
you so much. Thank you. We are Madera Once. Very happy to be here with all of you celebrating at U Chicago for that next Hispanic Heritage Month. That's that's what I'm gonna say. That's what I said, and it happened right here live. All right, um, we're gonna sing a few songs for you. We hope that you enjoy this next song. I like to joke around that we always hear that first year old's birthdays parties. Um, if you're Mexican and if you've ever been to a Mexican's birthday party. Um, and it's usually around midnight because that's the best time to play a song for a one-year-old. Ya está cerrada con tres Estando encerrada Vas a dejar pronto de quererme Pero la puerta ni cien candados Van a poder a mí detener don't know this but there's like one person behind these cameras so right now. <laughs> <laughs> um, that was La Puerta Negra by Los Tigres del Norte. Um, this next song that we're going to play is, what song is it Mario? Because I already forgot the service. Okay, awesome. <laughs> this next song is a pop song but it, it lives within the canon of popular music in Spanish.
Hace días perdí en alguna cantina la mitad de mi alma más el quince de propina. No es que sea el alcohol la mejor medicina, pero ayuda a olvidar. Cuando no ves la salida Hoy te intento contar Que todo va bien aunque no te lo creas Aunque a estas alturas Un último esfuerzo no valga la pena Hoy los buenos recuerdos Se caen por las escaleras Y tras varios te las nubes se van, pero el sol no regresa. Sueños de habitación, de un hotel de carretera y unas gotas de lluvia que guardo en esta maleta. Ruedan por el colchón de mi cama ya desierta. Es la mejor solución para el dolor de cabeza. Hoy te intento contar que todo va bien aunque no te lo creas. Aunque a estas alturas un último esfuerzo no valga la pena. Hoy los buenos recuerdos se caen por la escaleras y tras varios tequilas las nubes se van pero el sol no regresa hoy te intento contar que todo va bien aunque no te lo creas aunque a estas alturas un último esfuerzo no valga la pena hoy los buenos recuerdos se caen por las escaleras y tras varios tequilas las nubes se van. Pero el sol no regresa. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was El Sol No Regresa by La Quinta Estación. I'm remembering these things now. This, this feels familiar again. The next song that we're going to be playing for all of you is Un Puño de Tierra by Ramón Ayala. Se baile bailar desde casa. Pasó la vida, lo más recorriendo el mundo. Si quieren que se los diga, yo soy un alma sin dueño. A mí no me falta nada. Yo quiero, no miento, soy muy sincero. Y soy como las gaviotas que vuelan de puerto en puerto. Yo sé que la vida es corta, al fin que también la de. Gusto, la vida pronto 
se acaba lo que pasó en este mundo no más el recuerdo queda ya muerto voy a llevarme no más un puño de tierra Yo quiero, no miento, soy muy sincero. Y soy como las gaviotas que vuelan de puerto en puerto. Yo sé que la vida es corta. to say guys <laughs> <laughs> so we'll go into the next song um this next song is paloma negra um i always get asked what my favorite song is so i do i guess i do have something to say guys <laughs> um I, i always do get asked what my favorite song to sing is and it's this next song which is paloma negra most people are surprised that it's not a juan gabriel song because that's what most people know me for these days um but the song just you know gets to the core of pain. Ya no sé si maldecirte o por ti rezar. Tengo miedo de buscarte y de encontrarte. Aseguran mis amigos que te vas. Hay momentos en que quisiera mejor rajarme y arrancarme y a los clavos de mi pena.
ser mías de nadie más y aunque te ame con locura y ya no vuelvas a loma negra eres la reja de un penar quiero ser libre It's one of my favorite songs, um, Paloma Negra. Really speaks to heartbreak, which is like my favorite thing for the most part. I really enjoy it. <laughs> and you all do too. Es que nos gusta la mala vida, por eso. <laughs> so the songs that we've been playing so far have been really like songs that are, are part of Mexican tradition, if you've ever been to any gathering with Mexican people. This next song is actually an original song that I wrote, and it is called Llorar. I hope that you enjoy it. This song speaks to that moment you realize you've forgotten something you did not think you would ever forget. Hoy Recordé que no he pensado en ti y me dije que chinga es sentirse así. Que el sonido de tu voz se me fue con el adiós y este rostro tuyo no me lo pintaste para ver si tu mirar todavía me hacía temblar. Me pregunto cuándo es que te comencé a olvidar y quise llorar, llorar. Llorar. 
Thank you. Thank you very much. So that was an original by Madara Onse. We hope you enjoyed it. Usually we have like an audience callback during that song, but you know. <laughs> it's an easy song to remember. It's literally one word. This next song is a Juan Gabriel song. Um, <clears throat> it's one of my favorite songs to sing. And uh, um, yeah, that's it. It's a Juan Gabriel song that I love singing. Uh, one of the uh, sad Juan Gabriel songs. seguiré esperando no me he querido ir para ver si algún día que quieras tú volver me encuentres todavía por eso aún estoy en el lugar de siempre en la misma ciudad y con la misma gente para que tú al volver no encuentres nada extraño y sea como ayer y nunca más dejarnos probablemente estoy pidiendo demasiado se me olvidaba que ya habíamos terminado que nunca volverá ciudad y con la misma gente para que tú al volver no encuentres nada extraño y sea como ayer y nunca más dejarnos probablemente estoy viviendo demasiado se me olvidaba que Habíamos terminado Que nunca volverás Que nunca me quisiste Se me olvidó otra vez That was Juan Gabriel, se me olvidó otra vez. For a second there, I actually did forget the lyrics there. <laughs> um, it's 
been a while <laughs> since I've sang these songs. <laughs> and that happens. Pero muchas gracias de nuevo para todos um, for the invites. We really appreciate it. We're Mother Onza. You can follow us on Instagram, Facebook, other things. This next song is our last song. Um, we hope that you enjoy. I think you'll all recognize this beautiful gem. Amar. Yo me puse dispuesta a tus pies y tan solo con desprecios me has pagado, pero ahora hey, hey, hey. si una vez dije que te amaba, hoy me arrepiento. Si una vez dije que te amaba, no sé lo que pensé, estaba loca. Si una vez dije que te amaba y que por ti la vida daba si una vez dije que te amaba no lo vuelvo a hacer ese error es cosa de Thank you, Roma Dera Onsai. Thank you to everyone, you Chicago, Pachanga, all organizations involved. We appreciate it. <laughs> and thanks again. This was Madera Onse. Uh, thank you all for joining us. Thank you, Jocelyn Marie, for singing tonight, opening the night. Barbara Barreno Pachal, uh, uh, Milvia Rodriguez, the Latinx Heritage Month Committee, and all of the folks who, who helped put this event together, Marino. Uh, Enrique, uh, the production team here. Uh, we hope, although we can't be in person, uh, we're celebrating together and uh, that's what counts. Uh, again, uh, be safe out there, uh, go out and vote and uh, enjoy the rest of the evening. Thank you. <laughs>